Yes, we started uh, talking about it uh, last week that we wanted to look and see what the Bible had to say uh, about living long and prospering. And the Bible is my authority on any topic. That's where I go. And I believe what it says, and I, I try to apply what it says to my life as best as I can. So I've had uh, Christians all my life long, there are Christians who believe that it's a sin to prosper and that a Christian should not prosper. And I'll, Now, the truth of it is, I don't believe that, but people have made all kinds of statements, and there are some people who are Christians who are very greedy and covetousness, and they misapply some biblical truths and all, but you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know. So what I want to do today is let's look and see about living long and prospering. Let's just see what the Bible has to say about it. Is that okay with you guys? That's where I put my foundation on what God's Word has to say. And before um, we get into all this, is anyone here, anyone here, and just be honest with me, is there anybody here today, and you guys are watching online, you can be part of this question, the guys in the balcony, all you guys downstairs in our overflow in the cafe, is there anybody here who does not want to prosper? You know, I haven't had one hand raised in all three services as of yet. So that's kind of an indication that most of us would like to succeed, right, at what we do and all. So most people would not prefer poverty, would you? I don't think most people want to fail at anything. And, and the word poverty, it means scarcity, shortage, deficiency, lack, you know, hardship. And I don't think anybody deliberately wants that. Oh, we have enough of things thrown at us in life that we have to overcome and we have to battle against. That's why God gave us armor and all like that. But we don't just desire misfortune, do we? No. We don't want uh, disasters and, and calamities and destitution and deprivation. We don't want those kinds of stuff, you know. So anyhow, I want to just go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say on this topic. Now, y'all know what that is? Wait a minute. Actually, someone gave me this this morning, so I'd get it right. They came in on the sidewalk, and they gave me this. <laughs> so I reckon it's that way, okay? That's pretty cool. And uh, you know where that came from, right, the, that concept? Where did that come from? Star Trek. Exactly. Star Trek and, and, and uh, Spock. Do you all remember him? Now, is that just an old person thing? Are you young people know about this? Yeah? Okay. Well, anyhow, I said to myself, and uh, James, I was talking, I was telling him what I'm studying, and uh, uh, I asked him about it, and he said, well, why don't you call it this, Dad? Live long and prosper. And it's like, you know, like this. And uh, so I'm going, I really like that title. That's an awesome title. But if I have Spock on there and this kind of stuff, people are going to think I'm weird. Now, I'm already weird enough. I know that already. But So I looked at that, and uh, I may have told you this last week, but I looked it up, and you go on like Wikipedia, and you'll see that. And uh, this was based upon the Jewish uh, promises and the Jewish law and all. And that really, there was two hands in this old ancient picture. There was two hands and it was based upon uh, 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 a psalm and it was talking about living long and it was talking about prospering. It was based upon a scripture where God's word tells us to live long and to prosper. And uh, Spock got that from a Jewish guy who inspired them to use that on Star Trek. Is that pretty cool or what? You know, it's just like I'm learning how to do that now. It's like, live long and prosper, you know. Um, let me read you the verse. Proverbs chapter 1. Let's just look at this together. And it says, one verse 1 says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. You know, you will be much more joyous in your life if you don't follow 
advice that wicked people give you. And it says, all the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners. Now, there are times I do stand around with sinners a lot, and I try to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ, you know. But it's talking about don't just be adopting and adapting, you know, people who, who are against God, their ways is what he's telling us here. So he says, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. You know, mockers are just critical and judgmental and, and just speaking negative and gossiping and all that kinds of stuff. He says, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight, these people who are joyous, they delight in the law of God, the Bible, God's word. It says they delight in the law of God and meditating on it day and night. Now, you understand meditation is uh, like you, you buy a steak, you know, if you're at a restaurant and you cut a nice little piece of it and you put it in your mouth, it's still the restaurant steak. But you chew it up and you chew it and you chew it and you chew it and you pulverize it and then you swallow it. Now it's yours, okay? Now it becomes, <laughs> becomes ear and tooth and hair and eye. It's yours. It becomes one with you, you know. And when it's talking about it here, it says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating, chewing on it. Like a cow that actually has four stomachs and regurgitates its food and it chews it and chews it and then it chews it again and again and, and then it becomes part of the cow. But it says, but they delight, these people who are joyous, they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. These people who delight in God's word and they chew on it and, and allow it to become alive in them, it says in verse 3, they're like trees. These people who delight in God's word and they chew on it, they're like trees planted along the riverbank. Now, if you imagine a desert, but it has a river through it, on the sides of the river, all these trees grow because their roots run down deep into the water. It may be desolate everywhere else, but around the river, it's just, you know, life everywhere. And it says, they, the people who delight in God's word, they meditate on it day and night. They're like trees planted along the river, bearing fruit each season. Every season. There's not a season when they don't bear fruit. It says they're like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they, what's that word? They prosper in 50% of what they do. Right? Oh, and they prosper in all they do. They prosper at being a mommy. They prosper at being a wife being a husband, a daddy. They prosper being a businessman. They prosper in everything that they do. And see, prosperity, live long and prosper. It doesn't just mean dollars and cents because back in those days, most people didn't have too many dollars and cents. They had cows and chickens and goats and things like that. They made tables and they had product and stuff like that. But there's a lot of bartering going on. But God said that prosperity, prosperity is, is having an abundance, your needs met and everything that it was, emotionally, you know, spiritually, relationally. And he says here, you know, verse 3, they're like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. This is what God's word says. He said, if you love his word, you delight in it, you chew on it, you meditate on it day and night, he says, you're going to be like trees planted by rivers. You're going to have fruitfulness, and you are going to prosper in all, everything you do. That's God's word that says that. That's not just some man says that. That's what God's word has to say. And this is what it says in verse 4. But the ungodly, those who don't believe in God, those who resist God, are not so. They are not going to prosper in all they do. They're not going to be like trees planted by the riverbank. He says the ungodly are not so, but they're like chaff. You know, what in the world is chaff? You know? Well, since you asked, I'll show you what chaff is. There's nothing in that. Any good that was in that, any seeds, anything that was, is, it's gone. It's just the leftovers. After anything that was good was in it, it's taken out, it's just the chaff. 
It's leftover stuff that has no value at all. There, there's nothing nutritious in it at all. And he says, the ungodly are not so. But they're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And then as we go to Psalms 35, verse 27, it says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor, which that word favor means delight in, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Are, are you pulling for God's righteous cause? That God's kingdom would advance that men and women, boys and girls would come to know Christ, that righteousness would triumph in this world, that evil would not, that light would disperse the darkness. And he says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. You know what a magnifying glass does? It makes things bigger. So let's, you know, magnify the Lord so that he is more easily and clearly seen is what he's saying here and let them say continually let the lord be magnified you know enlarge so people can see he's talking about to honor to advance his kingdom here it says let the lord be magnified the lord who has pleasure in what he has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants hmm do you have pleasure in the prosperity of your children? How many of you want your children to do good in school? There's nothing wrong with that. How many of you want your children to have a good job one day, have a successful marriage? We want our children to experience the blessings of Almighty God in every area of their life, do we not? And our Heavenly Father, He delights in absolutely says he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. He takes no pleasure in our poverty or when we're just down and out. That's not what God genuinely wants us. And I do plead with all my heart. He wants us to have more than enough to meet our needs, and plenty left over to touch other people's lives. Maybe to sponsor a kid in Ethiopia. Maybe to buy a bag of groceries in the line where somebody don't have enough to pay for their groceries. Maybe to help this and that to where believers have more than they need so they can be a blessing to other people. I'm absolutely convinced that's what Jesus wants to do. I believe it is. You know that Jesus, did you know part of uh, his 12 disciples, did you know that Jesus had a treasurer who carried a bag of coins with him all the time? And they paid the widow's bills and they helped people out here. Sometimes he did it miraculously, sometimes he paid for it. You know, what was that guy's name? Judas, Judas yes. You know, and he, he kind of started dipping into the bag himself, you know. But you see that Jesus was not in poverty. He was not. They were giving to other people on a regular basis. But remember this passage. It says, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure, has pleasure in the prosperity of his children, in the prosperity of his servants. That's Jesus we're talking about. Now, the word here, prosperity, it means to be safe. It means it's talking about welfare. It's talking about being well and, and happy and friendly. And it's all about being well. It's all about being whole, good health. It's talking about being at peace and well-favored. And it's talking about resting safely. This is prosperity and affects every aspect of our body, soul, and our spirit. That's what it's talking about. So my question is, is it really possible is it really possible that God takes pleasure and delight when we're blessed? Absolutely. That's what he wants. He loves us. He's crazy about us. As you love your own children or crazy about your own kids there, you know. No parent wants evil for their children, you know. Well, um, question. Do you think we will prosper in heaven? Absolutely, Absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, Jesus taught us how to pray, did he not? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, which means holy, be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy, thy will be done. Where? On earth. We're going to prosper in heaven? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants to establish his covenant with his people. 
He wants his people to make a difference in other people's lives. He wants to have the, the resources and the confidence and the, the bonus to let their light shine brightly for other people. Now, there's always people who get caught up in greed and they become very selfish. We're not talking about that. We're talking about being extremely generous in our prosperity, you know, like Christ would be. Now, Satan would have us to believe that God doesn't want us to be resting safely. The devil would have us to believe that God does not want us to be happy and healthy. The devil does not want us to believe that, that God wants us at peace or, or, or to have favor with him. The devil wants us to believe that God does not want us whole. Listen to what he says here in John 10, verse 10. It says, and this is Jesus talking. He says, the thief, and we know he's referring to in the context of that whole chapter, he was referring to Satan, the devil. He says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. That's all that the devil is about. Killing, stealing, and destroying. Anything that has to do with killing, stealing, or destroying from our lives, that's the devil's work. But the devil tries to do that damaging work and go, see what God did to you? Uh, see what God did to you? Uh, see what God did to you? But Jesus said the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. An abundant life, a life in all of its fullness. Jesus said, I have come. My purpose is to give you life in all of its fullness, a rich and a satisfying life. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So if any time there's something that's trying to steal the blessings of God from you, trying to make you feel bad about them, you know, trying to bring destruction, that's the enemy of our soul who tries to do something bad to us and say, see what God did? And you know what the devil's tendency is? You know he's a liar, right? right? This is what it says in John chapter 8, verse 44. It says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him, talking about the devil, and when the devil speaketh a lie, he speaks of his own. For he, the devil, is a liar and the father of it. The devil is a liar. He's the one who does bad and tries to say, see what God did to you? To try to turn us from God. He's, he's into destroying relationships, destroying families, killing, stealing, and destroying. In any facet that it affects us, that's from him. That's not God. Listen to what it says here, this article I came across. Some years ago, a 94-year-old widow died in her home in Chicago. Honey, four years old. She was known as a collector of antiques. The administrator of her estate found an astonishing collection to things. There was a 50-year-old collection of chinaware, very, very valuable, paintings and unopened trunks. It was reported that altogether there were 20 rooms packed full with rare and expensive furnishings. A fortune in diamonds was found in the false bottom of an old trunk. A desk revealed several thousand dollars in cash as well as many uncashed checks and money orders. Some of the checks were so old they were worthless. They wouldn't cash them. And many of the money orders were sent to Washington for redemption. Now what would you have done with such a vast fortune? Think about it. What would you have done. You think that the poor rich woman, she knew what life was really all about? 20 rooms, absolutely jam packed with tremendously valuable collections of stuff. Like the eccentric woman in Chicago, we too are connoisseurs of what we term valuables, yet fail to use them properly, leaving the gifts and the promises of God un. God has so much for us, and I think that sometimes we do not access it properly. I read about this uh, Irish immigrant who had saved up his money. He wanted to come to this 
this country. And he saved and he saved for months and months and months. And he finally got enough of money to pay for passage on this big old ship that would bring him here. Weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks at sea. And he had gotten him a big old pillowcase like bag. And he had baked all these biscuits, you know, and these chunks of cheese. And he would wrap them in this wax cloth and all to try to cause him to last his whole journey. Weeks and weeks and weeks, months actually, to get from there here. And one day, several weeks into his journey, he was over in the corner somewhere and he was, you know, eating his biscuits or beginning to get moldy, you know, and his cheese was definitely moldy. And, off, and one of the guys who worked on the ship, he said, what are you doing, sir? He said, oh, I'm, I'm just having my, uh, my lunch here and all. And the guy said, don't you know? He said, when you bought your ticket, it included all your meals at these nice restaurants on board our ship. You could have eaten 12 meals a day if you'd have wanted to. And he was eating moldy biscuits and cheese. It reminds me of this passage in the Bible. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. They don't know. They don't know what comes with the ticket. They don't know. They don't know. Now, Satan would have you and me to live far below our spiritual resources far below our spiritual privileges. The enemy of our soul would have us to live far below and, and convince us, well, God don't care about you. He ain't going to provide for you. He's not going to take care of you. That's what the enemy of our soul, he comes to kill and steal and destroy relationships. And he surely like to destroy our faith in the almighty God, you know. Now, we're not to abuse our inheritance, you know, that God has given us, but we're not to ignore it either. It's just the truth of it, you know. Now, there are some people who have wasted their inheritance on righteous living. You remember the prodigal son? He wanted his part of the inheritance and he went out and spent it on riotous wild parties and all the scripture says. But I believe that God wants us to claim what is ours and to invest it in reaching prodigal men and women and bringing them into his kingdom. Listen to what it says here, part of the prodigal son's story. After he came to himself... He lost all of his wealth and on party and all. Then a famine came. He was about to die. And he came to himself and said, I'm going to have to go home to my dad. He takes really good care of his servants. So maybe he'll hire me so I don't die out here. And it says, when he came home, it says in Luke 15, 25, it says, Meanwhile, he'd already come home. Dad was having a party for him. Meanwhile, the older son... He wasn't the prodigal. He was the one who stayed home. The older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Oh, your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. And we're celebrating because of his safe return. And the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And his father came out and he begged him. But he replied, all these years, I've slaved for you. And never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Not one time. Listen to verse 30. Yet when this son of yours came back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, Look, dear son. And there was love in his eyes as he's speaking to his son. Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. Your younger brother took his half. And he wasted it. Everything he left is yours. You could have had as many goats or calves or cows as you wanted with all of your friends. You never asked. You, you never wanted anything. Does that represent us? Have we ever accessed the, the promises that Almighty God has given us? And are we jealous when we see somebody else who finally comes back to Christ and they start praying and their prayers are being answered? Well, God, why don't you answer my prayers? Well, have you asked? It says in the book of James, you have not because you don't ask. Listen to what it says here in Romans 8, verse 16. 
It says the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How many of you believe that you're a child of God? Awesome. Verse 17 says, and if children, then heirs. You, you understand what an heir is? You know there's an inheritance left and, and you're an heir. An heir means a possessor. No, that's mine. It says we're heirs of God, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Do you understand joint heirs? You know, Susan and I, now Susan is back there helping out uh, today. They, they need some help. They, they, uh, she's back here in the nursery. And this is, uh, this is hers. You know what that is? No, this is a checkbook cover. This is a checkbook. I must make a distinction because this is hers. This is mine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the truth of it is, we have a joint account. All right? And she could be back there right now and spend every penny that's in our account. Wouldn't get much, but she could wipe it totally out. Why? We have a joint account. And if while she's doing dinner today, I can be buying all kinds of fishing gear. <laughs> Thousands of dollars of fishing gear. No, I can't buy that much because there's not much in there. But if it was in there, you understand a joint account? She has just as easy access to it as I have. We both can, can wipe it out, use it as freely as we want to. It's a joint account. The scripture here says in verse 17, and if children, if we're God's children, then we're heirs, possessors, you see, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ you got to understand this, that everything that Jesus had that he worked with on this earth is available and accessible to you. The, there's this word, this Greek word that talks about the kenosis of Christ where when Jesus came and he grew up, he emptied himself out of all his divine ability. Never one time do you see Jesus work a miracle until he's 30 years old. And that's when the Holy Spirit filled him when he was baptized in water. The Holy Spirit came upon him and drove him into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights when he was fasting. And there was three days of his, three years of his life that he did miracles. But he did not do them because he was the son of the living God. He did them because the Holy Spirit empowered him. Same Holy Spirit that can empower us. And the Bible says, Jesus said, greater works you will do than I did. Jesus said that. And see, well, the thing is, the numbers right now are higher than the numbers of people back in them days. We can reach more people than he did. With the same power that was available to him back then, that is available to him now, is available to us. He says if we're heirs of God, we're children of God, we're heirs of God, a joint heir with Christ. Like I can write whatever's on that check... Susan or I, we have equal opportunity to draw what's in that account out. And you have just the same opportunity to access the inheritance that God has made available to you. But do you know what your inheritance is? Did you read it? Did you care? Did, did you bother to discover what is rightfully yours? And it says here, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. Now you got to understand something. Jesus never suffered sickness and disease. So we can't say, well, that, that's how we suffer with him. We all are attacked. The enemy of our soul attacks us all. That's why God's given us armor, hell and salvation, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, you know, our breastplate of righteousness, our loins are girded about with truth, our feet are shod with peace. We're in a battle to fight because the enemy's trying to steal, kill, and destroy us. And we fight. And we battle. We have real battles and real things that come against us. But God's will for us is to fight. God's will for us is to read the fine print of the will and don't let some smooth-talking lawyer steal your inheritance. Like the woman who had all those valuables, she never used them. Did her or nobody else any good? Think about how this relates 
to us. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer. And the only suffering we do with Jesus is persecution. When you share the gospel and people don't like it, when you shine a light in a dark place and they don't really like it. But I have found out something. Most people like the gospel. Most people are looking for hope. Most people are looking for some good news if you're willing to share it with them. Most people recognize their heart is broken and they need something. They genuinely do. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10 says, When thou hast eaten and art full, it's actually 12 o'clock right now, and I haven't had anything to eat all day, and I cannot wait for lunch. So when you're really hungry and you sit down to lunch, you go, God, thank you for our food. Amen. And you dig in because you're a little impatient. You're hungry. But listen to what the Bible says. When thou hast eaten, eaten and art full, you're, you're satisfied. Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the land which he hath given thee. Did you know you're supposed to thank him for the food before you eat it because it sanctifies it and cleanses it and you'll be healthy by it? But you know he says when you're satisfied, did you know at that point in time, biblically, he says, bless the Lord now. You're not in a hurry anymore. Like, Thank you, Lord. That was an awesome meal. You know, bless those who prepared it. You know, that's what he's telling us here. Verse 11, he says, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Least when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built godly houses and you dwelt in them and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein there were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of a rock of flint. Two million people quenched their thirst out of one great big old rock. Water, I don't know how it was in there, but water came out, satisfied the thirst of a couple million people, plus their animals, and filled up all their jugs. That was miraculous. And he said here in this verse, verse 16, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not. They didn't know what it was, but they knew it tasted good and it was edible. And, and, and that he might humble thee. And that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. He went through all these things and the Lord was there to help you, he said. Verse 17 says, And thou say in thy heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. He says, be careful. Don't you forget God. Don't you ever think you're so smart. Because who gave you your brains? God did. Who gave you your skill and your talent? Do you know it could be taken away just as easy as it was given? Who put you in the right place at the right time? Who gave you that deal or that bargain? And he says, don't ever say my power and my own hand have gotten me this well. Verse 18 says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. And that's what he wants to do for you. And that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Establishing his covenant. He wants you blessed. And it shall be, if thou do all, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. If you're following a false god, you're going to perish. I mean, if a false god is like a stick or a stone, it's lifeless, can't do nothing. If you follow that, you'll perish. But it says, don't forget, it's God that has put all these blessings on you. Don't ever think you did it or some false, you know, God did all that. Deuteronomy chapter 28, he's talking about establishing his covenant so people will recognize that your God is awesome. Listen to what he says. Deuteronomy 28, 1 says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commands, I give you to this day, and I must make this statement. What happens if we disobey God? Confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sins to God, he's faithful. 
And it's just to forgive you and to cleanse you from every wrong. And when you go back to God and you confess something that you've already confessed, and God goes, have no record of you ever doing that. Because when he forgives, he chooses to forget. So don't you ever forget that God loves to forgive his children and give you another chance. And it says here in verse 28, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commandments, his commands, I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city. How many of y'all live in a city? You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. You live in the country or it don't matter. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb, your children will be blessed. And the crops of your hand and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flock, your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and you'll be blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant you that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They'll come at you from one direction, but they'll flee in seven directions. And the Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. Everything, your family, your health, your, your business, your whatever it is, the Lord will send a blessing on your barns, verse 8, and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the people of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. The Lord, verse 11 says, the Lord will grant you what? Abundant what? And this is in the Old Testament. The covenant that we have now since Jesus has risen from the dead is even better. And it says in verse 11, the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. Have we seen several passages that indicates that God wants you to prosper? It's the truth of his word. And, and if you've been challenged and threatened and bombarded, the devil comes to kill. The devil don't want you to believe that. And you've got to understand this. Here's a zero, and here's a minus one, minus two, minus three to infinity. Over here is a, a plus one, plus two, plus three to infinity. This over here is faith, believing something good's going to happen. Did you know fear is faith? On the negative scale, you believe something bad's going to happen. The devil's always trying to get us to believe that God ain't good, that God ain't going to take care of us, that God ain't going to forgive us, and, and, and so forth and so on. He's always trying to get us to believe something and do you remember what Job said in the book of Job? He said, the thing I feared most came upon me. Did you know fear will activate things to happen the same way faith activates God to move in our life? And the enemy of our soul is trying to control us and to manipulate us with worry and anxiety and fear where we have to make a choice. I'm going to believe what God said, not what somebody else said or not that little whispering that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He says here in verse 11, the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, and, and, and the, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouses of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season. I'm going to tell you, the devil would like to send rain and wash all your crops away. But God sends the rain at the right season. So you prosper, so you are blessed. That's what he says. To send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Would you rather be the head? You ever been in a costume where somebody had a, a horse or a donkey costume? And you got to be back at their, their rear end and all. And they're up there at the front. You know, they're leading the guys. Like, I'd rather be the head. What about you? He says the Lord will make you, verse 13, the head, not the tail, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them. You will always be at the top and never at the bottom. God said that to establish his covenant so people would see that God's children are blessed. Verse 14 says, do not turn aside 
from any of the commandments I give you today to the right hand or to the left following other gods and serving them. And then in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. That means continue to speak it, pray what the word says, talk about it, share it with others, sing the scriptures, you know, which we do lots of times. He says, let God's word continue to come out of your mouth. Do not let the book of the law depart, you know, where, where it no longer is coming out of your mouth. He says, meditate on it day and night. I think we read about that a while ago. Meditate upon the word day and night. He says, meditate on the word. Think about how does this relate to me? Chew on it day and night where it becomes alive in you. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. What's the next word? Then. Then you will be what? Prosperous and successful. Almighty God said that about his children. He's establishing a covenant with. Then you will not before, but if, if you'll meditate upon God's word, you'll chew on it. You'll delight in it. He says, then you will, prosper, you will be prosperous and successful. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Don't give in to that fear. Start believing in the negative. Don't believe the lies of the devil. The devil is a liar and the father of lies. That's where they come from. He says, do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God is crazy about you. He loves you. He has made all kinds of provisions. One day when we get to heaven, God's going to say, you see all that? You never, I had it waiting for it. You never ask. I had this and this, but you never ask. You never appropriate. You never access the inheritance that I had for you. He wants you to live long, and he wants you to prosper. Well, whatever you do, he wants you to honor him. And we are pilgrims passing through. He said that we have an appointment. Okay, but we want to live long and, and, and prosper until our appointment. And he says, we all have an appointment. And after our appointment, that appointment is called death, where we face God face to face, and then the judgment. But if you've asked Jesus into your life as your Savior, your sins are forgiven, all your guilt is gone, you need not fear the judgment. That's the truth of it, you see. God has awesome plans for us. You know, at the age of 16, Uzziah, he became king at the age of 16. And he ruled as a king for 52 years. And listen to what it says about him. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 5. It says, and he, uh, Uzziah, he sought God. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the various, in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him what? God made him to prosper. God made him to prosper. Surely some people have prospered and they've been very selfish and they've been very greedy and they've given that a bad name. But not everybody becomes greedy. They're God-honoring men and women. But it says as long. As they sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And then in the book of John over in the New Testament, right before the book of Revelation, John shows in his prayer for, for uh, Gaius that prosperity and health are linked to your soul. Listen to what it says in 3 John verse 2. He says, Beloved, I wish above all, all things. There's a lot of things out there, but this is at the top of the list. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest, what? Prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosperous. Here's the question. Is your soul prospering? Well, how, do I, how do I do that, Pastor Ron? Meditating upon his word, chewing on it. Oh, it becomes alive. It changes things. It brings transformation. You believe what God says in his word. And he says your health and your prosperity are directly linked to your soul's prosperity. So we can do something about that. You read God's word and you chew on it and you think about it. You pray it. You share it. You sing it. 
and, and gets your soul prospering. The more you hear and you, you chew on you soak it in. As our soul prospers, so is our, our, our health and everything else that relates to us. Once again, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Psalms 38, verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. And he is good. He loves you. He's crazy about you. God is not mad at you. I don't care what you've done. He is so willing to forgive and reinstate your relationship with him. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints. And the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and to revere him and to love him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want. You know what the word want means? There's no lack. There is no want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. He says, verse 9, O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them, no lack to them that fear him, who revere him, who hate evil, that will try to separate him from God, who show him respect and, and reverence and, and love him. And then he goes and says in verse 10, the young lions do lack. And they suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want, shall not lack any good thing. God's crazy about you. Just like you are about your own kids. Do you only provide what will keep your kids alive? Well, here's enough food to keep you alive today. Or do you ever bless them beyond just absolute necessity? You bless them. And Lord, we don't know what's going on outside right now. But we hear an emergency vehicle. Somebody's probably in great need. And we ask that you'd meet those needs. And you would give those who are responding the wisdom to care for and help them and draw them all unto yourself. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen to what it says here in Psalms 84, verse 10. It says, for a day, a day, 24 hours, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I don't care where you've ever been that you had a blast. A day in the presence of Almighty God. I don't care if it's in a closet or it's in your car or if it's up on a mountain somewhere. A day in the courts, in thy courts, is better than a thousand elsewhere. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. God don't withhold things from us when we don't withhold ourselves from him. A man or a woman who will surrender their lives to God is that prodigal son who came back home. Even the elder son, if he repented, of not asking, not appropriate. When you and I surrender ourselves, our past, our present, and our future to the Almighty God, and we withhold nothing from Him, He withholds nothing from us. He's going to take care of you in awesome kind of ways and empower you and provide for you to make a difference in this world in which we live right now. You got to remember something, though. As God prospers you, let us always, Worship the giver and never the gift. You see at Christmas time, you give this awesome gift to a kid, they don't want to see you for a few days. They just won't play. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to be, folks. The disciples, Peter let Jesus get into his boat to preach the gospel. Afterwards, Jesus said, let's go out and catch some fish. They went out, they caught more fish than they'd ever seen in their whole life. Two boats were almost sinking, full of fish. They got back to shore, and Jesus said, y'all come follow me. And they kind of looked at, we ain't never seen fish. This is, all, this is years of wages probably for all of us guys here. And, but they go, the gift, <laughs> the giver. He knows where all the fish are at, man. Let's go follow him. And you know what Jesus did for their, their families there? These were the breadwinners 
for their homes. Their moms and dads had these fishing businesses. And, and, and Jesus took these strong men to follow him, but he left the family with great wealth. When they sold all those fish, the moms and dads, their fishing industry was well set while these disciples followed Jesus. Fall in love with the giver, not the gift. Money will buy a bed. How many of y'all sleep on a bed? I do like a, a sleeping bag, and I do like a, a hammock. You put it up between two trees, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Money will buy a bed, but it will not buy sleep. You can have a million-dollar bed and not be able to go to sleep. You know what I'm saying? Money will buy a book, but not brains. Money will buy food, but not an appetite. Money will buy a house, but not a home. Money will buy medicine, but not health. Money will buy amusement, but not true happiness. Money will buy finery, but not true beauty. Money will buy a crucifix, but not a Savior. I'm going to tell you, fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with the giver, not the gifts that he sends our way. He tells us in Psalm 62, verse 10, and we're just about done. He says, if riches increase... And God wants them to. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. He wants you to be blessed. He wants to bless your socks off. And so you can be a blessing everywhere you go. But he says, don't set your heart on it. Don't fall in love with the gifts. Keep your love for the giver. Second Corinthians, it tells us, if you look in chapter 2, it tells us that we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. He comes to do what? Kill, steal, and destroy. He'll do anything he can to get our eyes off of Jesus. That's what he's all about. Then one final verse, and we'll close. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. I don't know if you know that was one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet what your neighbor has. Don't covet your neighbor's house, the, your, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's tractor or jeep or car or, 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 or donkey or goat or chickens or whatever it is you're not. that's the ten commandments it says beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses like that woman who had 20 rooms full of extremely valuable stuff but she really didn't live much she never accessed it. She never used it. But the Bible says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. And you know what covetousness is? It's lust. It's lust for something. I want what he's got. I want she's got. I want what they got. You know. It's lusting for that. And that'll give me satisfaction. That'll give me pleasure. And he said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Our life consists in having the giver. When you got the giver, you got it all. And he wanted you to know he wants you to prosper. Not to become greedy and covetousness. But so when God says, I want you to bless that man. I want you to bless that woman. I want you to bless that kid. I want you to take care of a, a, a child in Ethiopia. I want you to do this. I want you to represent me on this planet. Then we can do it. Well, our time has gotten away from us here, and we'll pick up here next week. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name that has brought salvation to us, the name that heals the sick and cleanses the lepers, has even raised the dead. The name that has given us another chance. We come to you, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus. And we thank you, first off, for all the blessings you have poured out upon us. And we recognize every good thing we have, it came from you. We did not originate it, but it came from you. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. Especially thank you 
for forgiving us for all the sins of our past and for giving us another chance starting today. Thank you, Lord. And as our heads are bowed, I would ask you to pray with me right now. And those of you who know Jesus, would you reaffirm your faith in him? And those of you who are not sure if you do know him or not, would you declare your faith and welcome into your life today? I'd like you to pray with me right now. We're going to pray out loud together. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me. That's why you sent your son Jesus. I believe he gave his life on the cross for me. And I believe he rose from the dead on that third day. And I believe he's knocking at the door of my heart. And I open wide that door. And I welcome Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord, and as my King. I'm sorry for my sinful ways. And I turn from those things. I am determined to live my life for you. I'm determined to learn your word and to believe it and to apply it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As you leave...